The events take place in the county of Florette. The main character is a pleasant-looking girl with silver hair and amber eyes. Parents offer their daughter to marry a young man, and she immediately agrees. The parents were not prepared for such an answer, so they asked their daughter to think about their situation after all. But when they realized that the answer was positive, they were shocked by what they heard. The protagonist doesn't understand why her parents were so surprised at the answer she gave them. She asks her parents why they reacted the way they did, but he hears more questions in return. Her father cries out if she really wants to marry the Duke of Belfort because as far as he remembers, his daughter cried that she can't even breathe. The protagonist's mom is also shocked and asks her daughter if she is sick, adding that they are not forcing her to do anything, and if she doesn't want to, let her say it as it is. The girl is immersed in memories. She has been lying on her bed all her 22 years, citing that she is having a hard time. She didn't even have a debut. 16 out of 24 hours a day, the protagonist just slept. The father is worried about his daughter and thinks it's a bad idea, so he says he understands that the groom was recommended by the king himself, but it's worth refusing. The daughter interrupts her father at half a word and with a radiant smile on her face, says that she will marry the Duke of Belfort, so she asks them to calm down. The parents are touched by these words, the father cannot hold back his tears. The main character's name is Sylvia Florette. She is the only daughter of Count Florette. Her parents were ready to do anything for their weak-bodied daughter. They bought her countless outfits and jewelry. However, Sylvia claimed that they should have bought her a better bed, said that she would have a hard time at the debut, and asked not to organize it at all. When asked if she would go out to dinner, she said she had eaten yesterday. The parents did not know what to do, the father was desperate. He did not know who would take care of their daughter after they died. The wife tried to comfort her husband, but he argued that life was not eternal and no one would take care of Sylvia but them. There was silence in the room, but then it hit the two of them. The couple simultaneously thought of the same thing. Before they die, they need to find their beloved daughter a worthy husband. Unfortunately, the Florets could not find a suitable candidate and almost gave up. But suddenly, His Majesty proposed the Duke of Belfort. The parents immediately told their daughter about it. The parents weren't sure their daughter would agree to this, so now they are very happy. The father said that now they can die with peace of mind. But the girl had her own plans for this, because the Duchy of Belfort is a place where monsters often appear. It was unexpected luck for her, because it was hard for her to find a way to die. Her parents said they could only be happy now. Sylvia agreed with her parents with a genuine smile because she, Alice, can't commit suicide. The day of the wedding has come. Everyone in the Duchy of Belfort is talking about the Duke of Belfort's wedding. They were very happy about the news and chanted about it. But the Duke didn't look happy. Randall orders his underlings to stop and asks if they came to mock him. But they reply that they just wanted to congratulate the Duke and tell him not to yell at his future wife like that, because he is very ugly when he frowns. The Duke thinks about the fact that until recently, Sylvia was against marriage. He recalls how a couple of days ago, at the King's Manor, His Majesty had said that it was time for Randall to find a wife and that Count Florey was looking for a groom for his daughter. The King said that the Floret family had a long and rich history and would be perfect for the Duke. The head of the kingdom asked the boy what he thought of it. Randall realized that it was coercion disguised as a proposal, and the king wanted to bind him hand and foot in marriage for fear that the duke would gain power and strength. He wanted to refuse, but the territory of the Duchy of Florette bordered the land of Calvidia demons, and if the answer was hasty, the supply of food to the land of the duchy could stop. Since Randall valued the lives of his men, he decided not to resist the king and accepted an unfavorable offer. The Duke's men are still rejoicing at the marriage, and Randall thinks that they must know the circumstances, and that is why they are acting this way, because the event is indeed a joyous one to cheer up. But when the guy hears them say that their Duke is no longer a lone wolf, he coldly tells them that a morning workout awaits them on their return to which the underlings aren't too happy. Randall approached Austin and asked if the magic circle to the capital was ready. Austin, with bags under his eyes, 
replied that he had been preparing it all night and was dying of fatigue. Austin is the magician of the Duchy of Belfort. He told the Duke to go on his way, and the Duke said he would, and praised Austin. The magician touched the magic circle and it glowed. The Duke thought it would be nice to get along with his fiancée, but he was uneasy and didn't know if he could count the county of Florette among the king's supporters. He hoped he wouldn't have to remove his own wife. Sylvia was already in the Elvare's wedding hall. Her parents were very worried. They told their daughter to come back to them if the Duke treated her badly, and if she was unhappy, to turn the place upside down. Sylvia smiled and asked her parents not to worry about her, and then headed towards the hall. On the way, she thought about the fact that if she was unlucky, she would have to live a life she didn't want for a long time. She approached the Duke and greeted him saying that she was glad to meet him, and from now on she was Sylvia Florette Belfort. In her mind, she added that she would have to live her hundredth life. Ninety-nine. That's how many times Alice has been reborn. In her first life, she was a ray of light, a great sorceress who confronted demons in war. Everyone praised Alice, and she continued to fight demons just as willingly. To finally eradicate the demons, she devoted a lot of time to studying demonic power and explored the darkness. A little, but Alice learned how to use the power of darkness, so she was able to open a portal to the world of demons. Alice was immensely happy because she shared it with people, but they pushed her into a gateway leading to the demonic world. Alice had only one question, why? People fell victim to fear of Alice's growing power. Sitting on the ground of the demonic world, Alice kept asking herself the question, why? Why the people she was willing to sacrifice her life for had betrayed her? What could she have done after all? She only wanted to help people. A monster appeared behind the protagonist from the darkness. Alice turned to him in tears, wondering why people had done this to her. The girl had dealt with the monster. Several years had passed since that moment. Alice fought the demons alone and finally got to their king bias. After defeating the monster, she climbed to the top of the world. But by then, Alice was no longer human. In a fit of madness, she attacked the human world, though the people fled, but even so fell victim to her ruthlessness. When the human race was one step away from extermination, one man appeared, the hero, Cleon. He used the magic of the sword and cut off Alice's life. Thus, the demon queen left this world. Alice's last words were admonishments to the people from whom she had suffered so much. Suddenly, Alice woke up in a white wasteland, she immediately cried out in surprise, for now she should not be alive. Suddenly she heard a voice from the sky that told her that the girl had taken many lives with the help of the forbidden power of darkness, and for that she should be punished in proportion to her sins. The essence of the punishment given by God was that she had to live 99 different lives. Sometimes it was so hard for the girl that she decided to commit suicide, but Alice could not disappear from this world by her own will. By 99 lives, the girl was completely tired, and even when her last life came, a voice told her that it would increase the sentence if the protagonist tried to commit suicide. Alice, I mean Sylvia, couldn't have died. The Duke, seeing the girl, notices that although they have never met before, he has a strange feeling for some reason, but then thinks that he just imagined it. The couple entered the church, Randall glanced at the main character and noticed that she was thin, but stopped himself, as he didn't plan to get close to her. But the thought popped into his head that he should fatten her up. Sylvia thought that the Duke had a kind look, and that there should be no problem if she fulfilled her conjugal duties. As the couple approaches the priest, they exchange rings. The girl's parents are so happy that the father cries and the mother smiles at her daughter. The priest declares Sylvia and Randall husband and wife, and in addition tells the groom to seal the day with a kiss. The Duke realizes that the girl is three years younger than him, and if he kisses her now, his underlings will not leave him alone with their mockery. He somehow doesn't care, but the girl will surely be embarrassed. The groom decided that he should just pretend, and took the bride's bouquet and covered their faces with it, approaching the bride. He thought that would be enough, but Sylvia asked the Duke to come closer. When their lips touched, the Duke didn't realize at first what was happening. Sylvia kissed him on purpose,
because she knew that God was watching her and that she needed to give the impression of idol. After the kiss, the Duke's face was flushed. After the ceremony, they went to the ballroom, where the newlyweds performed a dance. The main character's thoughts were filled only with how tired she was and what to organize these banquets for. Guests cannot take their eyes off Sylvia. They talk about the beauty of the girl, saying that those who spread gossip about her will not soon show up at such events. The Duke is also handsome. No young lady can take her eyes off him. Looking at his bride, the Duke wondered if she was exactly 22 years old. The girl looked mature enough for the daughter of an earl. It seemed strange to the man, and he thought how to address the main character. But Sylvia pulled him out of his musings by telling him that the guy could call her by her first name since she thought the Duke was wondering how to address her. The Duke was shocked by the protagonist's words and wondered if it was written all over his face. The Duke replies that Sylvia can call him by his first name and address him as he is not a fan of formalities. Sylvia remarks that Randall is a good man. A couple of minutes later, a maid comes over and Sylvia goes to get changed. Randall decides to approach Sylvia's parents. He promises them that he will try his best to create an environment for their daughter in which she will not need anything, and if he is not good enough, they can tell him off. The parents are touched by this speech and say that they entrust their daughter to the Duke. The Duke asks if Sylvia has been on the estate for 22 years, but they say that she has never even left her chambers. She is naturally lethargic, so she sometimes sleeps for 24 hours. Her record is three days of uninterrupted sleep. The parents say goodbye to their beloved daughter and send her off to married life, while the Duke, remembering the words of his parents, ponders how such a thing is even possible because it is necessary to send her for a walk at least once a day. Austin approaches Randall to report that the magic circle is ready. The Duke praises the magician and heads toward his bride to call her. With a slight blush on his cheeks, he extends his hand to the protagonist and offers to go with him. Sylvia finds him very sweet. The carriage with the protagonist sets off. Randall, on the other hand, led his charges. The protagonist feels ashamed of Randall's kindness, but it was a plus because after the disappearance of the protagonist, he will easily find a mate. Silver only looks out the carriage window and realizes how far she is from home. She remembers her loving parents and wants to go to bed soon. On the way home, the Duke asks Austin why he's so downcast. The mage replies that after going through that second-rate portal that only looks good, he can't feel any different. Randall says that if that were the case, the mage could have created the portal himself, and they would have been at the manor a long time ago, since Austin is one of the most outstanding mages. These words embarrass Austin. But then he snapped back, because he had used up his mana this morning. But for an extra fee, he would consider the offer, and if the duke wasn't going to pay, it wouldn't work. Randall realizes what a mercenary his ward is. The Duke admits that as a child, he often wandered through those places, and it brings back memories. After another answer from Austin, he adds that he really wants to go back. Suddenly, the protagonist and her husband honor danger. The Duke orders the mage to create a barrier covering the forest area. Then Randall approaches the bride's window and asks her not to open the windows or give away her presence. A huge monster leaps out of the forest, the Duke immediately assumes a posture of attack, orders them to bear their swords and defend the carriage. The warriors, along with Randall, fought the fearsome monsters. Duke Florey begins to worry about his bride as it is the first time she has seen the monsters. But Sylvia, who has been through so much horror in the past, doesn't even bat an eyebrow at those monsters unlike her maid who shakes in fear. Geoffrey, a knight of the Duchy of Belfour, is fighting monsters. When he sees the Lord finishing off another monster, he calls the Lord amazing because he single-handedly killed half of the creatures. The knight hears a noise behind him and turns around to see a pair of children coming out of the forest. One child boasts to the other about his ability to find his way, but when the children see the knight and the monsters in front of him, they freeze in place. The knight is surprised and immediately yells at them to run away but the children are so frightened that they can't move. The monster sneaks up behind Austin and throws him into the carriage with the bride. 
The monster is now standing in front of Sylvia, but she is not afraid. She uses her powers to pit one monster against another. The knight watches all this, and words of surprise come out of his mouth. Sylvia whispers to the knight, and thus makes him fall asleep. Randall runs up to his wife and excitedly asks if she is all right. Sylvia replies that she is fine, but the wounded knight lying by the carriage does not look well. Everyone runs to him to stop the bleeding and help the wounded man. Duke clenches his fists. His comrade has been wounded by monsters and it makes him mad. Sylvia notices that the Duke is having a hard time. She takes his hand in hers and begins to calm him, assuring him that everything will be fine and he should not worry so much because Geoffrey will not die, and with a slight smile suggests the Duke to return to the manor soon. At the Duke's house, Geoffrey wakes up and says he thought he was dead. The wards say that the knight should thank Austin for creating the magic circle for teleportation. Jeffrey also begins to apologize to Sylvia for his unkempt appearance on the first day. Sylvia replies that everything is fine and reflects on the incident of the day. She didn't think that the day would come when she would again use magic and darkness at the same time. The girl was ready to die when the monster ran towards her, but the children and the fact that Randall called the protagonist made her change her mind, as she didn't want them to see her being torn apart by the monster. Sylvia accepts the fact that she will live a little longer and is glad that Austin was not around so he could feel her magic. Sylvia was a simple girl, at least the others thought so, and if the magician found out, he would have reported it to the Duke immediately. The protagonist's musings are interrupted by a maid who enters the infirmary to say that they are expected. Randall and his fiancée follow the maid in bewilderment, and when they leave the room, they are greeted by the entire staff of the manor with the words, Welcome, Madam. The Duke at once begins to reproach the butler and the eldest maid, for they met them immediately on the way out of the infirmary, and in reply he hears that he has spoiled all the plans by getting into such a mess on the way. After all, they wanted to greet the lady as soon as possible. Sylvia, with a soft smile on her face, thanks the servants and tells them that she relies on them. The headmaid says that she will gladly help the protagonist to settle in the Duke's house. The maid leads the girl to her chambers. On the wall hangs a portrait of the previous Duchess and Duke. Looking at it, the protagonist remembers that she met them in a previous life. Alice was reborn again and again, and the villagers chased after her thinking she was a monster. Wandering through the forest, the girl met a young couple fighting with monsters. Alice decided to help them and burned the monsters recommending the couple not to visit such deserted places alone and told them the way to the central road. The man asked his savior to give at least her name, but Alice did not, as it would be better for them if they did not know her name. Now looking at their portrait, Sylvia remembered that despite their modest clothes, their manners were of high birth. The older maid thinks that Sylvia liked the Duke's portrait so much that she can't take her eyes off it because the Duke was cute as a child. And the protagonist realizes that the couple's child has become her husband. It's evening, the Duke's wife is taking a bath, the servants have prepared a fragrant oil especially for their mistress. Sylvia said she liked it very much and it melted the servants' hearts. After the bath, the protagonist came into her husband's room dressed in a silk shirt. The Duke was also dressed in a shirt, and from the neckline his chest was visible. Looking at Randall, the girl noticed that the guy had a great body. Sylvia sits down on the bed and hears that Randall wants to talk to her, and the girl invites him to sit down beside her. The Duke is embarrassed to sit down beside her and thinks about the girl's tiredness because she has been through a lot today. And even if His Majesty has become a bridge between them, it is better not to rush the wedding night before they have real feelings. So he tells Sylvia to rest, but the girl grabs the Duke by his shirt and starts pulling. The Duke grabbed her arm and pulled her away. The protagonist didn't realize what was wrong since it was their wedding night. She tells her husband to keep talking while she slowly starts undressing him. But Randall is completely shocked by what is happening and begins to ask questions for whom and what the girl wants to do. Sylvia replies that it is her marital duty. The Duke tells her that he doesn't want her to force herself, but his wife says it's not like that. She doesn't force herself, but considers it her duty. The Duke sees the problem and says she doesn't even like him. 
but Sylvia denies it, saying that she likes Randall. From such words, her husband blushes and asks to get off him first because he is embarrassed by this position. After a couple of words, the girl thinks she is pushing him too hard and decides to get off. But suddenly, the girl falls on the Duke's chest. He again does not understand what is happening. He thinks that the girl is sick because she was shocked during the day or because she is injured, so he starts to call the maids. But then he sees that his wife has just fallen asleep. Randall tries to shift a little on his side for the girl's comfort, but the protagonist grabs his shirt. The Duke decides he won't sleep tonight. In the morning, Sylvia wakes up, and the first thing she sees is the Duke's sleep-deprived face. His wife asks Randall if they did it. Poor Randall reveals that he would never do such a thing to a sleeping man. But Sylvia meant herself. She wondered if she'd jumped the Duke in the night. The Duke is in shock, wondering who this girl is. The table is full of food for dinner. Randall is worried about his wife. She was exhausted yesterday, so he asked her to prepare the most useful things to restore her energy. For the girl's comfort, he's escorted all the servants out of the parlor. But the girl doesn't remember them doing anything. Sylvia had barely eaten once at home, let alone three meals a day. Randall looked at her like a grandmother who wanted to feed her granddaughter. The Duke thought she'd finally eat right. The Duke's wife wanted to ask him a question. The guy listened attentively. Sylvia asked when they would spend their wedding night, which was supposed to be yesterday. The Duke's face described all his feelings. He once again repeats yesterday's words about the need to want it. But the girl is worried about being called a duchess who failed to fulfill her marital duty. The Duke tells the girl about the adequacy of the people in the North, but these are the kind of people who betrayed the protagonist, so she thinks of the Duke as too naive or as a child. Duchess Sylvia needs to deceive God in order to die. Therefore, she needs to play the role of a perfect wife. The protagonist offers her husband to make a deal with her. The Duke doesn't understand at first what it is about, and Sylvia explains that since he can't spend the first wedding night with a man he feels nothing for, they should try to love each other. She suggested starting with touching. The girl said she would touch him whenever she wanted, and he could ask Sylvia for what he wanted each time. The Duke asked where exactly his wife wanted to touch him. Sylvia replied that a hand would be enough to start with. Randall was preparing for the worst, so when he heard such an innocuous answer, he immediately agreed. Then the bride asked what the Duke wanted from her. She didn't like the answer, for she was to eat the Belfort family's special dish. It was her husband's first wish, and she could not refuse. In her mind, she thought it was a cruel wish. Randall, walking along the garden path, can't hold back his laughter, for he is amused by the fact that a man like Sylvia can be smitten by a single dish. The Duke wonders if he has been too unapproachable, for his wife just wanted to hold his hand, even if it is an arranged marriage he would not refuse if she asked for it. But on the other hand, it was better for him, because the protagonist will always be in front of Randall. The protagonist decides to tell his fiance about the arrival of the vassals in four days. Sylvia asks if he is talking about a banquet, as it will be their first official meeting. Randall reassures his bride that there is nothing to worry about. It's a small banquet, so there is no need to worry, and Delma will help. And she can also ask Wilcott if she needs anything. Sylvia has been involved in such activities in her past lives, so it's not a problem for her, but she doesn't want to do it. She tells her husband that she will do her best. Randall says goodbye to his wife. She wishes the Duke good luck and calls him dear, at which Randall's face blushes a little. As she leaves her husband, she thinks of what happened as revenge for that dish. In the village of the Duchy of Belfort, the protagonist meets children who were in the forest with monsters. He asks them not to go to such places because last time they were lucky that the knights were near. The child says that they don't usually play in the forest, but their mom and dad always went to the same part of another forest to get medicinal herbs, but they were destroyed. Because of this, their mom and dad were very upset, so the children wanted to help them bring herbs from that forest. The Duke asks the children to be more careful next time and says goodbye to them. The Duke thinks about what the child said, because in the forest near the village, the herb garden is destroyed, which is strange because all wild animals are dealt with by the knights, and the option of monsters is also eliminated because there is a magic seal. 
Randall decides to check the seal just in case. The protagonist orders the knights not to let their guard down until they are sure the barrier is working, and they set off. Randall notices that people are coming to the forest less often, making the area darker. The Duke and his wards check the protective stones one by one, but there is not a scratch on them. The last stone remains, which is located in the middle of the forest. The protagonist notices that it is cracked exactly in the middle. The Duke doesn't like it. He senses the danger, because if the stone is broken, the barrier doesn't work, and at the same moment a huge snake appears from the forest. Randall orders everyone to duck. At that time, Sylvia is sitting in the mansion when she is drinking tea, a crack appears on the cup. Having defeated the monsters, the protagonist asks if there are any casualties. Fortunately, no one was seriously hurt, and there were only minor injuries. The Duke orders the injured to be sent to the manor. As he approached the stone, Randall noticed a clear cut. The monsters have low intelligence they would not be able to leave such a crack. It's not even a demon because if it appeared, Austin's barrier would definitely react. The Duke concludes that they are a force of darkness with nothing human in them, and they are just as capable of it. He pulled on his cloak and told the other knights to send him lists of all those entering and leaving the duchy's territory. Sylvia was called by the head maid, Delma. After walking into the banquet hall of the main palace, the maid explained that, like most castles in the empire, this castle was also sponsored by the previous emperor. Due to the fact that the duke belonged to the royal bloodline, and thanks to him, the castle had gotten such a beautiful appearance. Sylvia wondered why it was so old-fashioned, but it turned out that they had only recently started renovating it. The protagonist talks about the importance of the banquet hall, as it is the main gathering place for the guests, and could use a little more decoration. The maid liked the girl's words because she had already called a man from the trade guild, but he would arrive soon. Sylvia wanted to do so, but she was too lazy and was going to refuse, but she agreed. After entering the living room, the protagonist meets the head of the trade guild, Chick Gettle. Sylvia thanks him for his visit and invites him to sit down. The merchant realizes that the girl is beautiful, but he thinks that she will be easily deceived because she doesn't know anything about it. He hands the protagonist a catalog. The quality of the materials is really good. The headmaid asks how much it costs. Chick says it's 30 gold pieces. This sum is more than half of the monthly income of the Duchy of Belfort, since most of the money goes to help those affected by the monsters. The maid offers the merchant a lower price but he cries out that it was very difficult to get there because the way to the north is very difficult and dangerous. And even so, he voiced the price with a big concession. There is silence in the room and Delma is already thinking about the loan option. Sylvia tells the maid to wait and turns to Chick. With coldness in her voice, she tells him that she saw all this a few months before her marriage and asks him about his intentions to sell it all for three times the price because the goods are no longer relevant in the capital. The merchant starts talking about the novelty of the goods and the time it took him to reach the duchy. He states his name. The duchess replies that, in that case, Chick should be aware of her name, too. After all, if a lie were to be discovered, he would turn the Floret and Belfort families against him, even though he would be punished for disrespecting Sylvia for an act tantamount to insulting the imperial family. Chick is horrified and doesn't know what to say. When the girl takes the pen to sign the contract, the merchant stops her and offers to sell all the goods for 15 gold pieces. The maids are happy about this deal, and Sylvia signs. The Duke is overjoyed and wants to thank his wife, but the maid replies that the girl fell asleep as soon as Chick left. Randall was just about to go to bed. Sylvia lies in bed, looking like an angel under the moonlight. The Duke, seeing that the protagonist is sleeping, decides not to wake her up and lies down beside her. The protagonist wonders if the girl hasn't left her house all the time, but then he feels something wrong and realizes that it is his wife. He grabs Sylvia's hand and asks what she's doing, but she only remarks on the Duke's dislike of touching before the main business. Randall shrieks that that's not what he asked, but Sylvia began to complain that she didn't beg her husband every day and that they should have at least one time they were married. Randall sighed and hugged the girl and lay down on the bed with her saying that it would be enough. The Duke thought how strange she was. 
The next day, Austin comes to Randall's office with a report. He notices that although the Duke has always been lenient with his servants, something strange has been happening lately. The Duke looks at the report with a smile. The magician even compares him to a dog and asks his master what caused such a smile. The Duke remembered what had happened in the morning. How sitting at the table, he told Sylvia that she could touch his hand if she ate the food on her plate. But the girl wouldn't give up his hand. Then he offered a hug, and the protagonist agreed. After eating, she told him that the Duke would pay back in full at night. Austin calls the gentleman by name a couple of times, but he only responds when the magician starts screaming. Austin realizes what Randall is thinking and tells him of the possibility that his wife is a spy for the king. But the Duke coldly orders the magician to watch his language. After Austin's apology, the protagonist informs him of the need for a stronger barrier. Austin says that if the master supports him financially, he'll do his best. After Randall's approval, the magician says with a happy smile that he will do his best. Sylvia asks Delma if she has anything else to do, and she replies that any outfit suits her. In the morning, the protagonist had tried on countless different outfits and was terribly tired. As they continue on their way, they see Austin lying on the floor. The older maid immediately begins to reprimand the mage, but he barely rises, yelling that the maid is too noisy. He says it's not lying around, because a man like him would never allow himself to do such a thing and it's all planned. The maid insists and says she'll get it out of there. But Sylvia stops the maid because the lighting, temperature, and humidity of the place seemed perfect to her. She decides to sit there and tells the maid to mind her own business if she has any. Austin still suspects the main character and thinks she's the king's spy. The magician starts drawing magic circles on the paper. The protagonist noticed the formula for the protective barrier she had once created as Alice, but it had nothing to do with her now. Austin had miscalculated and had to do it all over again. Alice decides that the best option for her is to stop the magician and asks if she can have a look, because after all, her father is the deputy dean of Elvaris Academy. Austin says that the girl did not attend the academy, but she snatches the paper from the magician's hands and says that she has heard and seen quite a lot. Looking at the paper, she realized that her help would not be useful here because according to Delma, Austin was the next person after Alice worthy of the title of a great wizard, but he was very far from Alice. The girl did not even notice how she corrected the drawings. The magician at first considered it disrespectful that the girl used his drawings as a draft. Austin stares intently at the paper, and when he realizes that the protagonist has corrected his drafts, he is speechless. Sylvia thinks it is right that she intervened and asks Austin not to tell anyone about what the girl wrote. The magician feels guilty for suspecting the protagonist. The butler dresses the Duke of Belfort in fancy robes. Randall says the servant makes a bad husband because he keeps his wife waiting. After a few more machinations, the butler announces that he is ready. The Duke looks in the mirror and notices that he looks more dressed up than usual and he hears that only in this way he will be able to stand confidently together with his mistress, because before that, he was not inferior to anyone in appearance. Randall says with a smile on his face that apparently it's time to give in and wants to see his wife in her new outfit soon. As Sylvia finishes her preparations, her maids can't get enough of her mistress and ask her to wait a little longer. They shower her with compliments, saying that they have never seen anything more beautiful in their entire lives. Sylvia is already tired from all the exertion and remembers how many hours she has been sitting there. But she also enjoys watching the delighted faces of her maids. The maids inform Sylvia that her husband is ready and that he is waiting for her at the door. The protagonist is wondering how she can get away from it all next time. She comes out to her husband in a fancy outfit and apologizes for the man having to wait on her. Randall is speechless as he walks up to Sylvia, takes her hands in his, and speaks fervently of her beauty. The protagonist thanks the Duke for such a compliment and asks if she will come to the bedroom in such an outfit tonight. From these words, the guy's face turns as red as a tomato. The protagonists enter the ballroom and thank those present for coming to congratulate them on their wedding. The Duke introduces his bride and asks to honor her as well as Randall, because she is the mistress of the Belfort estate. 
The guests of the feast admire the beauty of the couple, noting that although the Duke was famous for his appearance, they did not think that the Duchess is so beautiful. Also, the girls talk about the fact that the Floret family is on good terms with the Imperial couple, but apparently do not worry because they are a beautiful couple. But the Lady in Purple standing nearby clearly does not like such talk. The Marquis of Sacrine approaches Randall to greet him. When the Duke asks if his daughter has come with the Marquis, he replies that the girl wants to go to war, so she has gone south and will not return. The protagonist replies that the girl has been a tomboy since childhood and asks how things are in the South. In response, he hears that everything is coming to an end and the Crown Prince is not sitting still. Sylvia, watching her husband, thinks how good he looks and is surprised because the higher the rank, the more a person becomes arrogant. But Randall is not like that. The Duke sees everyone as his equal, so the protagonist thinks about how to fulfill her duty as soon as possible, and does not see Randall before his piercing gaze does not read the deep thoughts of the girl. Suddenly, a nice-looking lady approaches Sylvia and says she is pleased to welcome the Duchess. The lady in the purple dress introduces herself as Rubea Glover. The protagonist looking at the girl realizes that she wants to say something because people from this category Sylvia sees through, they show their unprecedented affection, which later blinds them and they begin to go against the will of the Lord. Sylvia notices a girl standing across from her, looking exactly like that person, and feels the lady's dislike for her. Rubia asks the Duchess if she can ask her an indiscreet question. After the approval of the protagonist, the girl asks if Sylvia knows what chance the North has missed because of her and Randall's marriage, because now the Duke needs support more than ever, and marriage is a great way to gain additional ties and power, and the Florette family is loyal to the Imperial couple. Rubea looks at the protagonist with violet eyes full of hatred and asks how the Florette family can help the North. The Lady in Purple says that the seat where Sylvia is sitting should belong to another lady who can be the Duke's support. There is silence in the hall, and all the guests stare at the girls in shock. Rubea hopes it's enough to get through to the Duchess, and if she's really thinking about the Duke, she'll back off. Looking at Sylvia, the girl notices that the Duke's wife is weak and probably dumbfounded by what she said, because she can't find the words. She expects that the protagonist will cry or faint, because if Rubea can show the guests the weak side of the Duchess, their opinion will be immediately spoiled. But Sylvia is not very excited and replies, so what? The Lady in Purple is dumbfounded by the girl's answer. The protagonist asks if anything should change after Rubia's words and tells her that if she doesn't want to accept Sylvia as her Duchess, then let her make a claim to the Emperor, because she knows very well that the marriage was not made by her and the Duke's decision. The golden-haired lady doesn't know what to say because she certainly didn't expect Sylvia to react this way. Sylvia adds that it is cowardly to criticize her knowing the circumstances. After the protagonist sees that Rubea does not know what to say, she becomes bored because all these provocations are boring. But suddenly, the protagonist notices a magic circle appearing at the top of the ballroom. All the guests panic as an octopus tentacle emerges from the portal. When the whole monster comes out, people start to run away in terror. Sylvia rises from her chair and stares at the huge monster. The Duke shouts to his wife to run away, but the protagonist apparently has her own plans. The girl hopes that the octopus will plunge her into eternal sleep. No one will suspect, and the girl will finally be able to go to heaven quietly and peacefully. Suddenly, Rubea grabs the protagonist by the arm and drags her behind him, asking why the girl is standing there. Sylvia looks at the golden-haired lady in bewilderment, not understanding why she decided to protect her, since a few minutes ago, Rubea hated the Duchess. Suddenly, the monster blocks the girl's path and swings in for a punch. Sylvia thinks about the problematic situation and gets hit. The monster wounds the Duchess and she falls to the floor. A tear runs down the golden-haired lady's cheek. The Duke, seeing that his wife has been wounded, cries out her name in panic, but Sylvia can't hear her. Suddenly, the girl woke up near a body of water looking into the water she remembered her first life, where her name was Alice. She turned around and saw a boy beside her. A teenager with silver hair was sitting near a tree, leaning on his knees, apparently thinking about something. 
Alice asked the boy his name and remembered that she had done the same thing last time. The boy told the protagonist that his name was Cleon. Alice remembered the warrior Cleon and asked the boy if his name was Leo. Cleon asked the girl if she was hard of hearing. The protagonist, ignoring Cleon's words, calls the boy Leo again and asks if he will go with her. The teenager replies that Alice must be completely deaf. But then the guy rises to his feet and says that since the protagonist saved him from the monster, he can call him Leo if he wants. After that, the teenager followed Alice and began to do small errands in the camp. But whether the protagonist remembered correctly, whether the boy was the same Cleon, when she opens her eyes, Sylvia realizes that she is in the Duke of Belfort's mansion and has never been able to drift off into eternal sleep. Her mind is a mess because the same boy Leo has become Cleon. Cleon was the one who had killed the demon queen in a past life, and Sylvia couldn't accept that fact. She is pulled from her thoughts by her husband's voice. Randall sits beside the girl's bed and asks how she is feeling. For that day, Sylvia almost lost her life. The Duke says it is too early for her to get up, for although Austin has healed the wound, it has not yet fully recovered. Sylvia looked at her husband and stood up to ask him something, but Randall repeated what he had said earlier about the girl's condition. The protagonist replied that it didn't matter now. Reaching out her hand to the boy's face, she asks excitedly if he was crying because Randall's eyes were red. Sylvia clenches her fists and asks herself why this man confuses her every time, as if he is with her forever and will stand by her side no matter what, as if he is looking straight into her soul, and because of this, the girl hesitates. Randall touches his wife's hand with a slightly hurt expression. Sylvia says that the Duke's actions are very nice indeed, but he replies that he was worried. The protagonist, touched by this response, calls the man to her, telling him to lend her his body. The guy looks at Sylvia incredulously, but she assures him that she has no bad thoughts and says that she is just cold. Randall's gaze softens, and he decides to embrace his wife. The Duke burrows into the girl's warm embrace. Sylvia notices that this time is different and hears her husband's agreement in return. After leaving the Duchess's arms, Randall tells his wife that after the monster was destroyed, he sent a letter to Count Florette because the girl's parents must know what happened. Sylvia says that her parents are probably on their way to Belfort. The Duke reassures the girl that the protective barrier that Austin is creating has not yet been finalized, so he told the girl's parents about the danger of coming now and barely talked them out of it. The girl praises her husband for this because she was already tired. But Randall tells the girl some not very pleasant news. He says he can teleport Sylvia to Floret territory. The girl didn't expect that. The protagonist says that even though Austin will rebel, the territory of Floret is close to the capital, so it's possible, and if he sends the girl home, she won't be overstretched. Sylvia doesn't know what her husband is talking about, but Randall is not joking. He tells the girl with a serious face about the dangers of the North and that it is not the best place for a quiet life, so the Duke decides to send the protagonist back to Floret. Sylvia didn't look happy to hear that, not even a few days after their wedding and he wants to send the girl back. The Duchess wanted to object, but looking at her husband's face, she realized how hard this decision was for him. But she realizes that to distance herself from the Duke means for her to distance herself from his death. The girl cannot allow this and says that her reputation as a Duchess will suffer greatly from such a decision. But her husband objects, saying that no one would dare insult his wife. Sylvia asks about her obligations as mistress of the duchy, but Randall says that before marriage, he managed everything alone and nothing will change. The room grows quiet. Randall clenches his fists and stares steadfastly at his wife. He thinks his decision is the right one because he has been too relaxed lately. Even the shadow worms have infiltrated their territory, so he has to be careful. He is not even able to keep track of what is going on around him the guy was just suspecting Sylvia of being a spy. Remembering how he held his wife's hand on the day of the ball, he blames himself. For if he had been a little more vigilant, the Duchess would not have been hurt, so he believes his decision was right. Randall sits frowning. Deep in his heart, he doesn't want to be away from his wife, but he can't leave her in the Duchy of Belfort because it's too dangerous. Sylvia calls out to her husband and tells him that her home is there now. She holds out her arms to him. 
She embraces the boy and says that she likes the North, Delma, the people of the manor, and Austin. But more importantly, she likes Randall. The boy can't find the words to answer, and Sylvia begins to wonder if her words sounded sincere. But in a split second, she feels her husband's arms wrapped around her. The Duke thanks the girl and asks her to forgive him. Sylvia, with a slight blush on her face, tells him not to apologize, and he tries to object. But Sylvia interrupts him and is surprised that Randall can be so stubborn. The girl smiles and touches her husband's face. The Duke looks at the protagonist with a blush. A girl approaches her husband's face. There seems to be no better time for a kiss. But Randall jumps up abruptly from the chair he's been sitting in all this time. The Duchess doesn't know what's wrong. But before she can think of anything she is wrapped in a blanket, the guy says that she should rest because he will call a healer and leave Sylvia alone. The girl smiles because at least the Duke was not hopeless. Randall was embarrassed and wondered what he was thinking, especially when his fiance was ill. The Duke should get ready, he still has things to do. Duke recalls the events after the octopus attack. Randall. I furiously asked the people present who dared to bring the teleportation stone into the banquet hall. Everyone was silent. Then he said that he was giving a last chance. If the criminal confesses, then the protagonist will only finish him off. But if he keeps silent, then the Duke will catch him anyway, and the whole family of the one who did it will go to the scaffold. The Duke coldly asked who dared to harm his wife. Rubia timidly raised her hand, saying that the stone was attached to the hem of her dress, along with a ribbon. The Duke looked at the girl and asked her what she wanted to say. The lady in purple was frightened by Randall's look, for he was very angry. Rubia's father whispered to her that she might be under suspicion from such words, but the girl stood her ground, saying that this detail was very important, for it might be an important clue. The golden-haired lady stood up and approached the Duke. She began to tell the truth about what happened, according to her, when the monster appeared in the banquet hall to stop the bleeding of the Duchess, who protected her, she tore off a piece of her dress. Then she noticed how the stone fell, but did not pay attention to it. But the girl could not be mistaken, for it was the stone she saw that caused all this. Stepping down the corridor, the Duke is again immersed in the memories of that day. After the testimony of the Marquis of Glover's daughter, they were learning all about her recent activities. Suddenly, one vassal pointed to Randall's servant. He cried out that this guy was guilty, because before the monster appeared, the old man saw him take a stone out of his mouth and it was necessary to capture him immediately because the vassal had nothing to do with this man. The Duke, with a serious face, recalls how fearing the Duke's wrath, the elderly man did not immediately confess. The servant was taken into custody and it ended with his execution. Before his end, the servant said that it was hard to survive nowadays. He had never seen that man before, but he promised the guy a lot of money for doing that job. The guy with the ponytail couldn't refuse. The man the servant first met may be one of the shadow worms. Randall concludes that action must be taken as soon as possible. The maids cannot be happy that their mistress is all right. They are very worried about her and ask how the girl is feeling, whether she has recovered. The servants prayed day and night for Sylvia's health and even made a doll similar to her. Duchess, thanks to Austin's magic, was able to recover without any problems, but it would not hurt to look sickly and weak in front of the wards. So the girl says she is better now, but rest is still necessary. The girls almost cry at the words of the protagonist and inform her of the surprise they have prepared especially for their mistress. Sylvia doesn't understand what they are talking about, but sitting down at a table full of food is not very happy. The maids happily inform the Duchess about the set of healthy food and wish her a pleasant appetite. The main character looks at all this with disgust because she is not used to eat so much healthy food and thinks just to refuse. But looking at the happy faces of the maids, she cannot utter a word because she feels sorry for them. After the meal, the girl goes for a walk with Delma and says that she is not feeling well, but the older maid praises her mistress for the work done because everyone's spirits have risen from the fact that Sylvia ate everything with appetite. Delma threw a cape over the protagonist because it was chilly outside. 
The girl thanked the maid and thought about the first aid the daughter of the Marquis of Glover had given her that day. Sylvia hadn't expected that the lady in purple could keep her emotions from taking over. However, when the Duchess fell into the arms of the Marquise's daughter, she noticed the strange reaction of Rubea's father. He frowned to himself, saying how could things have gotten so messed up? When his daughter asked for help with first aid, he simply said that she should run away because it would be too late. Sylvia has a bad feeling about this. Suddenly, a girl with golden hair caught the protagonist's eye. The girl recognizes Rubea, but she nervously averts her gaze, then approaches the Duchess and says that she is pleased with Sylvia's recovery. She says that she should thank the Duke's daughter, because thanks to her efforts, she was able to recover quickly. The Duchess thinks to herself that she could have gone to heaven if it hadn't been for Rubea. The girl with golden hair nervously adds that she would like to say something else, and then starts to say that she should be thankful that the Duchess saved her, and since she has already made sure that Sylvia is all right, she will probably go and wishes the protagonist a nice walk because the weather is just right. Sylvia is shocked and says, well, Rubia runs away, and before she realizes what's happening, the protagonist asks if Rubia has magic because Sylvia thought she sped up time. Delma replies that she must be shy. The Duchess tries to ignore this and asks the older maid if she can ask her a question. After the maid's reply, Sylvia asks if Marquis Glover is on close terms with Randall. Delma replies with a smile that he is. Then the Duchess asks in her ward if something could have served as a motive for the Duke. The maid is a little surprised by the girl's question, but decides to answer. Remembering the little Duke, she says that she will have to pull up the archives. The situation occurred a few decades ago when the palace was in a struggle for the throne. However, the two princes filled with brotherly feelings did not want to conflict on this issue. A man dressed in a fine suit very similar to Randall tells his brother that he does not want to become an obstacle in his path and believes that it is his brother who should inherit the throne. The red-haired prince is very grateful to his relative, but he does not understand how to be because the passions in high society are getting hotter. In response, he hears from his brother that he also thought about it and decided to propose something. The red-haired guy does not understand what his brother is talking about, but the guy with the amber eyes says he will go to the north. The red-headed prince tries to talk his brother out of it because it's very dangerous and asks what he's saying, because he shouldn't go so far because of the power struggle among the aristocracy. The boy in beautiful robes assures him that the North is devastated and that the lost prince will find something to do there. The current king, moved by these words, walks up to his brother and hugs him tightly. And just like that, the second prince gave up his surname Locrin and took the surname Belfort based in the North. He was the father of the current Duke Randall Belfort, the previous Duke Elvis Belfort. Looking at the picture of the previous Duke and his family, the sod continues his story. Upon settling into the new territory, Elvis's first order of business was to unite all the families scattered across the North. Duke Belfour's good-natured and sincere intentions melted the hearts of the local nobility. Sylvia, looking at the portrait, tells the maid that they are no longer alive, to which the maid, after a short pause, replies that the previous Duke and Duchess fell in battle with monsters. This may have been a tragedy for the current Duke, but Randall was very young at the time. The eldest maid is immersed in memories again, the northern nobles discussing who will take the Duke's place, for Randall was still very young at the time. The blonde aristocrat argues that the boy can't do anything because he can't even defeat a monster. Another aristocrat adds that now the North needs not a weakling, but a real master, and they can't wait for adulthood so he proposes to nominate someone among them as a candidate, and he hears that he thinks only of his own benefit. Through a crack in the door, little Randall is watching all of this. For the boy who recently lost his father, it was a big blow, and determined to prove his importance, the boy goes in search of the monster. After catching it, he brought the monster's hand as proof. All the servants were shocked by such an exhausted Randall, says that he is also useful, and faints before finishing the phrase, because he spent all his strength on it. The rumors run excitedly to their master. 
Delmas says that after the publicity of the incident, people became sympathetic to the boy and began to criticize the aristocrats who were trying to satisfy their insatiable greed and supported the Lord. Eventually, the emperor, that he was feared, recognized the succession and conferred the title of duke. Though under the pretext of friendship with the prince, he watched over the Lord until he was ten years old. In between, Marquis Glover was one of those who led and united the aristocrats. From the gentleman's point of view, the Marquis of Glover protected him in his youth, so he trusts the Marquis. Sylvia did not expect that Randall had such a virginity, because she, seeing the malleable character of the guy, thought that it was because he lived a quiet and measured life. The protagonist thanks her maid for the story. In the evening, Sylvia walks around the room and thinks about Delma's story. She thinks that if Randall trusts the Marquis of Glover, she will be very shocked to learn that the Marquis is somehow connected to the Shadow Worms. The Duchess thinks about how she might hint to her husband about this, as the girl is used to such things, so she would not be surprised to learn of the betrayal. But she worries about the Duke, as she thinks he is a fool. Randell, in a white robe, enters the room and asks his bride why she is still awake. Sylvia looks at her husband's face and thinks that he will definitely be annoyed by this fact. So she decides not to tell him about it and calls him to her, because the guy promised that tonight he will sleep in her arms. The girl asks if he has forgotten about it. With a genuine smile, she tells her husband to jump on the bed. Randall is wary of Sylvia because he thinks she will do something naughty again, but gets on the bed. The protagonist jumps on her husband without warning and turns him backwards upside down. Randall cries out, asking his bride what has happened to her. But the girl assures him that she is not going to do anything and tells the Duke not to move. The boy is shocked and asks why she is pouncing on him. Pulling the robe off the Duke's shoulders, the girl notices the many scars on his back. Sylvia is horrified by what she sees. The Duke asks his fiance what is wrong, and the Duchess feels sorry for her husband because at such a young age his back is covered with wound marks. The boy had to prove his favor in order not to lose his place. The protagonist can't even imagine what he went through at such an early age. The Duke tries to reassure his wife and says that everything is fine, so he asks the girl not to make that face. Randall thinks that Sylvia is worried about him. He shouldn't be happy, but for some reason he feels so good. But the girl takes up again, and with her touches, she makes the Duke blush. The next day, Austin began replacing the barriers with stronger ones. After finishing one barrier, Randall tells the magician that there are ten more seats left. On the way to the next location, the Duke wants to discuss something with his servant and tells him so. But Austin replies that one minute will cost the protagonist one bronze coin. The Duke agrees, but says that the story is not about him, but about his friend. Austin doesn't really care about that, so he tells him to just tell it. The Guardian says that your friend has a girlfriend, but she's only interested in physical intimacy and doesn't seem to have any feelings for him. A guy complains that a girl constantly behaves as if she needs only his body and asks the magician what to do. The mentee asks if his friend likes this girl sincerely, although if he didn't like her, he wouldn't even think about it. After hearing these words, Randall realizes his feelings for the protagonist and wonders when he started to like her, because he is happy that the girl cares about him and sad that she only wants a body from him. The guy is interested in every little thing that concerns her. The guy blushingly remembers his wife, how he told her he didn't want her to love him by force. Randall berates himself for overlooking such obvious things and for not being able to understand himself. Austin continues to talk and offers to attract the girl's attention with a gift, claiming that it is a win-win option because people like it when he is given something and adds that the more expensive the gift, the better. But in fact, this is only the magician's personal opinion. Randall looks at his ward and asks if the Duke has sworn off the magician without words. Austin says, otherwise, the Duke's friend needs to express his feelings somehow. He can just stick around and care until the girl wants to get not only his body, but his soul as well. The protagonist liked that answer and smilingly replied that his friend would have to try harder. At that time, Sylvia meets Rubea. The girl did not expect such a guest and asks how come the Duchess is here. The protagonist replies that the weather is fine, so she wanted to go for a walk, but did not find a company. 
The Marquis's daughter apologizes and says that she is uncomfortable now, but Sylvia does not plan to give up and says that saving a life does not mean that the girls can become friends. The golden-haired girl does not know what to say to this and asks Sylvia to wait for a while, saying that she will come soon. After that, the girls and two knights go to the noisy market. On the way, Sylvia thanks Rubia for agreeing to walk with her and asks if there have been any problems since the last meeting. The Marquis's daughter replies that thanks to the Duchess, there have been no problems. Suddenly, one man happily asks who it is that has come to the market and answers himself that it is their lady. The golden-haired girl does not look very happy to see him. The merchant asks how come, because Rubea said she would not come today. The girl blushes and asks why the man is always acting as if she were his daughter. She hears that she is not his daughter, but he sees her as his daughter. The woman standing near the merchant starts to reprimand him and then tells the daughter of the Marquis that since she has come, let her taste the fruit. She also asks the girl how the Marquis is doing. The golden-haired girl looks tired of all this. Looking at Sylvia, she notices when she was already looking at her and asks why the protagonist is looking at her like that. The Duchess seemed to think that Rubia didn't like being in a hectic and disorderly place. The girl proudly replies that she is an aristocrat, so she is responsible for the land and its inhabitants, and asks what is so strange about doing her duty. Sylvia starts to tease her friend and says that she didn't expect this. The protagonist laughs and says that she will not do it again. As an apology, she holds out a beautiful butterfly-shaped barrette with purple stones to the golden-haired girl. It matches the Marquise's daughter's eyes very well. Rubea wants to refuse the gift, but Sylvia says she has already paid for the hairpin and holds it out to her friend. The Marquis's daughter accepts the gift shyly, thanks to the protagonist. The Duchess notices the girl's honesty and thinks it is very nice. The protagonist suggests the golden-haired girl to continue their journey. Rubea didn't think that the Duchess can do whatever she wants. The evening comes, and both girls sit on the bench not knowing what to say to each other. The Marcus's daughter decided to start the conversation first and asked Sylvia to tell her why she had decided to meet her today. The protagonist asks if Rubea remembers what she said to her at the banquet. The golden-haired girl asks if the Duchess thinks about the time when she said that Sylvia was unable to help the North. The Duchess means it, and she tells the girl that she is right because the protagonist doesn't know anything about the North and is going to fix it. Sylvia just thought that her friend knows a lot about it, so she asks her to help her study it. But the Marquise's daughter refuses because she doesn't want to help her. But Sylvia says that as long as she is alive, Rubai will not become a duchess, so it is more reasonable to help the protagonist. The golden-haired girl is furious at these words, but the duchess ignores them and asks if Rubea is close to her father, for even when the monster was right in front of him, he ran to his daughter despite the danger. The girl remembers her father fondly, for after her mother's death, he raised her alone, and they spent a lot of time together. Her father even taught her how to shoot a bow. Rubea says with a smile that she thinks Marquis Glover is a very warm man. Sylvia does not think that the girl is hiding something, and she thinks about the possibility that the Marquis is acting behind his daughter's back. Rubia continues her monologue about her father, saying that he is a very outstanding person, because without him it would be difficult for the current Archduke to take the title. Her father is supported in every possible way, even by the common people. But the daughter of the Marquis admits that recently he began to overload her, but her father organizes his daughter frequent walks to relieve fatigue. Rubia didn't even notice that she had said all this and realizes what is happening now and starts to ask herself why she is telling the Duchess all this and claims that she has used her tricks to seduce her again. Sylvia asks her why she just accuses a man like that. The protagonist, looking harmlessly at her friend, declares that she didn't seduce her and that she just fell for the girl's looks herself. Rubea starts snapping at him and the Duchess replies that those are her words. Jeffrey notices that the girls look very much alike. Suddenly, the knight sees someone approaching and prepares to attack, asking who it is. The two friends don't understand what's going on, and Sylvia looks toward the servant and notices her husband. 
Randall stands with a bouquet of flowers and a plush toy, with a frowning Austin standing behind him. Sylvia asks what it is, but the Duke, handing the bouquet to his wife, says he just remembered the girl saying the room was cold. Inside the toy is a heat stone so that by hugging it you can get warm, the guy says that the color of the duck is very similar to the Duchess and is just as cute. Sylvia is not very happy about this compliment. Jeffrey asks Austin what's going on. The magician says he tried to stop the Duke, and he should have realized right away that the Duke wasn't asking for relationship advice for a friend, but for himself. But at that moment, money clouded Austin's mind. The knight, looking at his master, wonders if this is really the man who rules the whole North, and in his thoughts asks the master where his tact is, because the face of the mistress is getting darker and darker. Perhaps in her thoughts, she is already planning to file for divorce. Sylvia looks at the gift emotionlessly, thinking that with this gesture, her husband is trying to tell the girl not to even touch it and thinks of it as a problem. The Duchess is going to ask her husband about it. But looking at the expression on the Duke's face, she realizes that he just wanted to give her a gift and get her attention. Sylvia, with a smile on her face, thanks her husband for such a lovely bouquet and toy. Randall takes his wife away with him. The Marquis's daughter looks disappointed, for deep in her heart she had hoped that she would take the place of the Duchess of Belfort for the good of the North and its prosperity. And even if it didn't work out right away, the golden-haired girl was going to seduce Randall and bring Sylvia back to her homeland. With a puzzled expression on her face, the Marquis's daughter came to the realization that she shouldn't even try. As she looked at the Duke, she realized that she could not get the heart of one who looked at another with such eyes.